welcome to Calvary Church. We're so glad that all of you are here. And I don't know how preachers do, but I don't know if I can hold this Bible and mic at the same time. <laughs> See, normally when I do the Bible, I just push the button, and uh, it shows up up there. But we're going to try to do this the right way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Matthew 11, 28 to the 30th. Venid a mí, todos los que están trabajados y cargados, y yo os haré descansar. Llevad mi yugo sobre vosotros y aprended de mí, que soy manso y humilde de corazón, y hallaréis descanso para vuestras almas, porque mi yugo es fácil y ligera mi carga. Now she's going to tell you what I just said. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now we're going to read from Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. A todos los sedientos, venid a las aguas, y a los que tened dinero, venid, comprad y comed. Venid, comprar sin dinero y sin precio, vino y leche. ¿Por qué gastaste el dinero en lo que no es pan y vuestro trabajo en lo que no es, en lo que no os hacía? Oíd atentamente y comed el bien, y se deleitará vuestra alma con grosura. Come, all you who are thirsty, Come to the waters, and you who have money, come, buy, and eat. I'm sorry, <laughs> you who have no money, <laughs> come, buy, and eat. <laughs> come, buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. God is calling us this morning, and we're here, so let's all just, just enter in, give him the praise and worship that he is worthy of. Individually and, and as a church family, let's receive from him. Oh, it feels good to be in the house of the Lord. Yes. You say amen to the word. I mean, the word is so powerful, isn't it? Just, just a, a touch from God. We can already feel his presence this morning. I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a moment here, but it's so good to see everybody this morning. Just, it, it's always good to be in the house of the Lord. It's always good to be among other believers. Amen. It's, it's just good. And, and the Lord's presence is with us. And uh, we're, we're here to give him praise and receive what he has for us this morning. Amen. Let me lead us in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here this morning, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name, Lord. We're here to give you honor, Lord. We pray that you'll receive the praise that we have for you as the worship team leads us, that you'll receive it well, that you'll receive it with the honor that it is intended. And we pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts and minds this morning, Lord, to receive what you have for us, Lord, and that your Holy Spirit will continue to be ushered in. We give you the praise and the glory, Jesus. And your name. Amen. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have 
This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. King G. 
my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your good
Oh, come on, let's lift up glory and honor and praise to the one to whom that name belongs today. Come on, the Bible says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Hallelujah. We bless and honor Your name, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Are you convinced today that He has no rival? Because if you're not convinced, you'll still leave your options open. That there may be another hero, another Savior. If you're leaving your options open, you may even think at times that you are your own hero. And that you can save yourself. But our God has no rival. There's no equal. There's none beside Him, above Him. Everything is beneath Him. And so we look up to Him. I want to pray over us in this moment. We have some specific needs to pray for, but we'll get to those in a moment. The first scriptural selection that Feely read today, Feely and Diana read, just keeps going over in my mind all throughout worship today. Come unto me, all who are weary. And I will give you rest, Jesus said. He had been addressing some confusion that had been among some of the disciples in verses previous and then began to speak to some unrepentant regions of that area where they had been preaching the kingdom and spoke about those areas. And then Jesus begins to, to speak to the Father and begins to thank Him for what He's entrusted Him with. And, and I'm paraphrasing it here, but in short, Jesus says, Father, what You have given, You've given it to the understanding of or to the revealing of the little children. It wasn't for the kids. It wasn't just for a younger generation. But He was talking about those who just had simple faith. Faith to believe. I love studying the deep things and trying to get in and unearth things of this treasure that we have called the Word of God. And it is alive and there's revelation and understanding there. But if we try to approach God and His Word just intellectually, if we try to approach Him and our relationship with Him just by just some kind of head knowledge that we can have of Him, there's not a deep power in that. I know we say there's power and knowledge, and to an extent there is, but in the things of the Spirit, the source of the power is in Him and His Spirit. And to know Him is not to just approach Him with, well, God, how are we going to do this? Here's my strategy, and here's what I know could work. But it's approaching Him with faith. We're in a series this month called Battleground. And some of you have come in here today and you may be weary, you may be tired, you've been trying to figure this out with your own reasoning and intellect. I'm not calling us ignorant or dumb. We're pretty learned, we, we've lived some life, you, you've got some understanding and some wherewithal, but, but at the end of it all, it comes down to our faith in Christ. And we either believe that He can, that He's able, that he has the ability, Sister LaDonna, that he sees where we are and he is able to handle where you're at and what you've got going on. We either believe it or we don't. We either believe that he's sufficient or he's not. What I believe here today is that I'm in a room of people who believe. We don't just know, but we believe that he's sufficient and he's able and that he can do above and beyond what we could ask or think. And so we have to believe that His invitation is good and that there's something there to be received. And if He said, come unto me, all who are weary. Tyler's going to bring the word in a few moments. We'll have a response time and whatever isn't resolved now, we'll, the rest of it will get resolved then. But I just, in this atmosphere, in this moment right now, I want us to together 
offer up that thing or things that may be wearing you down, may be tiring you out, fatiguing you mentally, draining you emotionally, all of those things do affect us spiritually. And I want us just right now to accept this invitation of our Lord and our Christ. He said, come unto me, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. The adversity may not disappear, but He's going to give you a rest and a strength, a peace that the Bible says passes understanding as you and I navigate those things that you have going on in your life. Right where we're standing and seated today just as a congregation, can we just lay this thing out maybe that you have going on before Him? Come on, let me pray over us today. Lord Jesus, we've heard Your Word already in the opening of this worship service. We have sang and declared You to be the all-powerful God with no equal and no rival. So You are the one who's able to handle what we have going on and what we may be going through. So I pray over Your people today, whatever warring may be in the minds and in the hearts and in the spirits of Your people, we know You are the victorious one. In this invitation to come unto you, to take your yoke upon us, to lay down the burdens and the cares, the heaviness of sin and shame and our own efforts and our own works and our own ability and our own reasoning and to just hold to faith that you're enough. God, I know that you're here to give rest to your sons and daughters. God, I know You are here to give that rest and that strength and that help. And so we surrender here this morning. We surrender it all before You. The One who's worthy of all praise. The One who's worthy of all glory and honor. You, the worthy One, the Holy One, are the sufficient One. The all-powerful One that can that can handle what we have going on. And so as we give You our cares, our worries, and our struggles, our circumstances and our trials, we give that to You. And from You, we receive the rest You're here to give today. And the strength and the help that You, Your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to be our help today. And we thank You for that gift today. Come on, would you just thank Him for His Spirit that is here giving strength and help and life. Today, we thank You, Jesus. We believe and by faith, we receive what You're here to give and to do in this room today. And we give You praise in Jesus' name. Come on, give Him honor and glory in this house one more time. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can be seated just for a few moments here. Thank you for your standing all through worship and just this time of prayer. I want us to continue in prayer. I don't want to take much more time up here. Tyler has a word to bring, and you're going to be blessed from this message today. But I want us to pray for some members of our church family. I'm never ever fully aware of all the needs and the things that you may be dealing with or navigating and going on. And so our not mentioning them isn't because we don't care. We just may not know. But some needs that we are made aware of and do know about, we want to pray. And I want us to pray for LaVon Pitts today. For our sister, she had a heart procedure, uh, working on a pacemaker and and uh, I guess just kind of rewiring some things. And it was an extensive surgery. I had to go back under a second wave of anesthesia and just a lot of work. She told me last night, she said, they were just beating up on me. And that was their words, not hers. They told her, uh, we beat up on you. And, and she's still very sore and recovering. And uh, I know she's watching online. And we want God to be with Sister LaVon today. To touch her body and to give her strength this very hour. I want us to pray for Jim Wood. Brother Wood, a number of you know him. Some of you may not know him or don't know him well. 
uh, in his later years here in life, he's suffered from stroke and, and some of the uh, disability that that has brought him. And in recent weeks, his body's taken a, a, a major turn for the worse. They weren't sure if he was going to make it through the night last night. And so families there with him, we miss Terry and Sheila Haynes and Ben and Kim Callahan as those daughters and son-in-laws gather around and family gathers in. Uh, he may have a rally point and he may, he may prove everybody wrong and hang in there for days and weeks and who knows. We don't know, only God truly knows. But I want us to pray for this man who served as a missionary for years in Iran and who pastored for years in Cahokia and has just been a servant of God. And has loved people, served people, led people to the Lord. And I want in whatever final moments may be in his life, I want God to just envelop him with a peace and a comfort and a strength uh, and just to fill that place with, with his holy presence. And so let's pray for Brother Jim Wood and for the Haynes and the Callahans today as well and for the Haynes navigating their health issues and the things that they've had going on as well. Let's remember them in our prayers. So can we just right now lift these needs up before God in prayer? Would you partner with me? Can we call the names of our brothers and sisters out together? Lord Jesus, we bring these needs before you, not informing you, but exercising our faith, uniting together as one body, God, knowing that you hear us when we pray. And so, God, I ask that you would touch LaVon Pitts this morning, give her body strength, we thank you that she came through this procedure. God, that it all went well. We pray for her recovery and healing process, that it would be whole and complete. God, give her the rest and strength she needs today as we're gathered here in worship and as she watches online. May she feel that help and strength of your presence. God, I pray for Jim Wood, for this brother. God, I thank you for his years, decades of service. For your name's sake, Lord, in Iran and here in the Metro East, only you truly know the lives that he has touched. Lord, for your glory and gospel's sake. God, and in these final moments, however many hours or days or weeks perhaps that may be left, I pray that you would comfort him and give his body and mind peace and rest, Lord. God, we know that this is not the end for the believer, but this is just the beginning and the receiving of, of the full redemption that you have for your people. And I pray you would comfort him in this, these closing moments and this closing chapter. Be with Terry and Sheila Haynes and Ben and Kim Callahan. God, comfort them as well, I pray. God, and heal the bodies there. Heal Sheila. Touch her body and Terry as well, the things they have going on. And for Ben and God, we just ask it in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. And we'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. And let the church say amen. Amen and amen. Thank you for these prayers today and for this worship today. I feel like our hearts have been prepared to receive the word of the Lord. Man, I asked Tyler McVeigh, thankful for him and his wife Emily and, and how uh, they've invested in our students and youth these last couple of years. And I shared with him as we were coming up on March here, a series I was working on. I said, man, I want to invite you just in the middle of it. And I rarely tell people what to preach. In fact, I didn't give him the content of what to preach. Uh, he sought the Lord for this, but I said, here's the theme. Here's kind of the big, big idea that I feel just for this month and this series of weeks uh, think on it, pray on it, see what the Lord lays on your heart. And I know God has given him a word for this house today. Are you ready to receive a word from the Lord today? Anybody thankful, amen, for the living word of God today? Amen. Tyler, I want you to come. Appreciate you, friend. Appreciate you, brother. Anybody thankful for this family? Amen. Let's open our hearts up and receive the word today. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, I just, I want to say, what, it's an honor uh, to be up here in front of you all and to uh, preach a word. It's an honor to be a part of this series. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say, um, last week was so good. I, I don't know how I'm going to be able to follow that up. If, if you look around, there's not very many churches that tackle the hot-button topics that need to be tackled, and I, uh, I appreciate Pastor tackling those 
those topics. And I, I love that I'm a part of a church that stands for the truth uh, in, its, in its entirety and doesn't try to twist or manipulate things uh, to whatever they want it to be. Uh, because if you look around, that's becoming a, a, a rarer uh, thing nowadays, and it's sad. But if you guys could stand with me for the reading of the word, I would like to share a verse of scripture as I open up, and I pray that it would go off for some of you like a bomb. It may not for all of you. Um, this may not be for everybody. But if you're fighting a battle that's bigger than you, then I feel like this is for you. And the scripture is found in Second Chronicles 20, verse 17. Are you ready? ready? This is the word of the Lord. And actually, in general, I'm going to minister a little bit off of one of the songs we sing here, I'm going to see a victory. Um, referencing Romans 8.28 and Genesis 50.20, uh, some of the main themes of, uh, of Scripture, uh, where God takes what the enemy meant for evil and he flips it, and he flips the intention of the enemy and uses it to produce a purpose in your life. And if you want this to be your word as I read it, just give the Lord some praise. You will not have to fight this battle. Tell somebody, not this one. Take your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do not let the devil tell you what he wants to tell you and that there's nothing you can do about it. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Can we give the God, Lord a shout of praise for his promise? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated in the name of Jesus. Uh, we just wrapped up a series in youth. You guys are going to have to forgive me. I have my phone up here because, uh, well, it's been a morning. I just all I'm going to say, it's been a morning, I woke up, my iPad was dead, which is what I had all my notes on, it was at 98% last night, I have no idea what happened, so it's charged now, we should be good, but just in case, I got this as my backup. But we wrapped up a series uh, in youth class on dating and relationships, and it's been great. This last January marked the day where my wife and I celebrated our uh, seven year anniversary, which is bananas. To think about. I, 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 I think about the day that I met her in 2010, and this is not a marriage sermon. I'm just throwing this in there. I don't even, I, I've not been married long enough to give marriage advice, y'all, all right? <laughs> I met her back in 2010, so we've been in some form of a relationship for about 14 years now, a little less. Um, and before we got married, I remember talking to my parents, scared out of my mind the night before, just I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I didn't pay bills. You know what I mean? I didn't have rent. I didn't have anything. Scared out of my mind for, for the journey and excited for the journey that was coming our way. And I remember specifically my mom and dad telling me one thing, and it's you have to choose your battles. Not every battle is worth it. You've got to decide, is this little thing worth waging a war over? If Emily, or I'll just gonna, let me change that. If I do something that Emily doesn't like, <laughs> if I put the, the spoon in the dishwasher where the, 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 the spoon part is pointing up and you got to pick it up with your finger, I don't know, like, or if I snap the pasta in half before I throw it in the boiling water, I don't do that. But if I do something small, is it worth getting tripped up over something? In your relationship, is it worth getting tripped up over tiny things? Choose your battles. And it's wise to choose your battles when you can. But what do you do when the battle chooses you? What do you do when something shows up on your doorstep and it ain't from Amazon Prime? You didn't order it. You didn't order it. You had nothing to do with it. What happens when the devil shows up and drops something off for you to deal with that you didn't cause, choose, or anticipate? Like Jehoshaphat. Uh... He, didn't, he, he was face-to-face -face with a battle that he had no idea was coming. He was told one morning during a time of spiritual renewal, I might add, for Judah, uh, in a time of momentum and, and great uptick, you know, everything's going good. You know what I'm talking about. 
Everything's going good. You're getting your momentum going. Everything's going the way you want it to go. Just when you get it figured out and just when you're in your groove, boom, something happens. And here comes some news. Second Chronicles 20, 1 through 2. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites and even some of the Meunites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar. So they're sneaking up from behind. They're going around the Dead Sea and sneaking up to attack the people of God. They can't use the normal route, so they're sneaking up from behind. And they're not that far out. And that means Jehoshaphat doesn't have time to develop a strategy. He doesn't have time to get an army together and mount a defense. He doesn't have time to wonder how any of this happened. It's coming, and it's coming now. Have you ever gotten that phone call, that text message, where something sneaks up on you, and you got to deal with it right then and there? It's a day's march away. That means I don't have time to call anybody. I don't have time to watch my favorite TV show. I don't have time to read a book. I don't have time to get my nutrition or my sleep. I don't have time to ask other people's advice on the situation. It's coming, and it's coming now. This one caught me off guard. This one slapped me upside the head. This one, I'm not even sure if it's real yet. This one, I don't have time to get everybody's opinion. And the response of the king is urgent. What did Jehoshaphat do? He said he doesn't have time for all this, but he has to go to God. There's something about a surprise attack that will drive you into the presence of God. There's something about the one that you didn't see coming that makes you run to the place you should have been running to in the beginning. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but they were coming, and the response of the king was urgent. In verse 3, it says, Jehoshaphat was alarmed, but he resolved to inquire with the Lord. I love that. He was determined to seek the Lord even in the face of an unexpected attack. And even though he was alarmed, he already knew what he was going to do. He was basically face to face with it. It's a day away. He has no idea what he's doing, but he's already made up in his mind he would go to the Lord in this time of need. But Jehoshaphat was not always like that. And sometimes we are not always like that either. Sometimes we don't always seek the Lord and pray about everything. We think that we can do it on our own. A few chapters earlier, he got hooked up with King Ahab, the wicked King Ahab. And he almost got himself killed. As a matter of fact, King Ahab did get killed in this situation. They wanted to attack a city, right? During this attack, Ahab got killed. And, and, and what's crazy is the prophet Micaiah tried to tell him, hey, these false Baal prophets, that's what was going on at the time, they're telling you what you want to hear, but it's not what you need to hear. And if you go out there and fight that fight, you're going to get yourself hurt. And he did. And he barely made it out. He went out and he fought the wrong battle. Have you ever barely made out, barely made it out of a battle you weren't supposed to be in? You weren't supposed to fight? I remember growing up in high school, I had a a, a circle of friends, we were all guys, two guys were going at it. And one thing about guys is sometimes you just got to let them go at it. Because most likely, especially that young, most likely they're going to get in their spat and then they're going to figure it out and they're going to be fine the next day. I had another friend who thought, He was going to ride both sides of this battle, and he was going to try to get them to make up and resolve their differences on his time. So he got his nose into this battle. And what happened? The two friends resolved their battle, and they started attacking the friend who put his nose where it shouldn't have been in the first place. Instead of letting them do it on their own, he wanted to help resolve it. Sometimes when you step into someone else's fight, and it's not your fight, they're going to turn around and start fighting you. Don't try to take on a fight that's not your fight. Because if you do, you might find yourself in trouble fighting a battle that doesn't belong to you. I I don't tell my opinion on everything. 
I'm going to tell you that right now. I don't tell my opinion on everything because I know it's going to start a war, okay? And I'm very opinionated. I am very opinionated. I get that from my dad. I, I, I am opinionated, right? I got an idea. I got ideas of how things should happen and how things should run, and I keep my mouth shut sometimes. I try to a majority of the time because we have to choose our battles. Jehoshaphat wanted to know during this time, is this my battle? Is this my fight? Is this something I should be involved in? Am I called to this? You've got to be very careful not to expend your energy in a battle that's not yours. Because then you're not going to have the energy to fight the battle that the devil dropped off at your doorstep and you had no idea it was coming. If you're arguing and depleting your energy over something so pointless with people you don't even know, how are you going to fight the battle that comes in your own family, in your own life, in your own health, in your own situation? This is my favorite time, election year. I love it. I literally, I love it. That's not a joke. That's serious. I love it. I used to hate it because if you have Facebook or social media, it gets crazy. And I have learned to just read comments and laugh and enjoy myself and take it as some form of entertainment. I open Facebook. I click on some comments. You can ask my wife. There have been times where I've sat next to her, laughed out loud, like hysterically laughing because some of the stuff that's going on. It's crazy, but it's an important year. And sometimes there will be occasions where you do have to stand up and fight. Because if we don't stand up and fight, especially as Christians, there's not a lot. You can't toe the line on everything. You, there are things that are coming up against us, battles that are coming up against us, that the enemy wants us to be silent on, and we can't be silent on. Because if we are the ones that are silent on some of these hot-button topics, how can things be changed? If it's even possible for things to be changed, how can they be changed? But there will be times where the enemy comes at you with something so tiny that you don't agree with, and he wants you fighting someone else. He wants you to spend all of your energy on something so goofy while he is coming up from behind to attack you at your weakest moment. And sometimes it can even happen in the church. You've heard this from pastor and, and many others. Uh, I'm going to echo it. I have no interest in fighting Christians. I have no interest in it. Because at the end of the day, everyone who is a Christian is trying to accomplish the same thing. We're brothers and sisters in one body trying to do our absolute best, right? Will we argue? Absolutely. Will we disagree? 100%. We are human. We are not perfect. But I'm telling you, the enemy wants nothing more for, than all, for all of us in this building, especially right now during a crucial time, to start fighting each other and starting pointless battles. He's going to come up and get us from behind if we're not careful while we are depleted. You have to know when you're wearing yourself out swinging on something that you shouldn't be swinging on. You know how you can tell you're fighting the wrong battles? If you're trying to control others. You're fighting the wrong battles. You can't change somebody's heart. It's not in our ability as a human being to change somebody's heart. Live at peace with all men, but there comes a point where the peace of someone else becomes their responsibility, not yours. I had to learn this the hard way, right? I, I am that guy. I want nothing but people to like me and be happy. You know what I mean? I just want you to be happy. And there have been times we're growing up where I have gave advice and I have, you know, tried to force people to be happy. But there will come a time where they're not going to listen to you. And it becomes their battle. This is a heavy topic. Because as Christians, we should be locking arm in arm with people. So it is our responsibility to spread the love of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. But I've talked to people who are stressed out over the fact when they've shared the gospel and people won't listen, it's not your battle anymore. There are people who will not listen to you. It is not your battle anymore. After a certain amount of time, you have to step back and say, that's not my battle. I tried everything I could, but I couldn't. I couldn't change them. It's not my battle. I'm going to give you some advice. I do have some advice. I don't have marriage advice, but I do have some advice <laughs> as a 29-year-old man who has been around some drama. I'm going to give you some advice next time someone wants to pull you into some gossip, okay? Okay? 
Next time someone comes up to you and says, what do you think about so-and-so? Or, hey, did you? That's always how it is. How, what do you think? Did you hear about so-and-so? Here's what I say. I don't. What did you think about so-and-so? I don't. I don't know. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. And let me tell you, it works 99% of the time. It works about Donald Trump. It works about Joe Biden. It works about your friend who dropped their kid off at school next to you that might be having a hard time. It works about your fellow church member. It works about me for sure. It works works. I'm telling you. What do you think? I don't. My heart is a full-time factory of drama, okay? It has got its own drama. We've got our own drama. We're human. We have our own stuff that we've brought into church. I can't handle other people's. I'm barely making it as it is. I'm barely holding on as it is, y'all. I can't look at somebody and judge them based off of 10 seconds of a situation where I don't even know the whole thing. That is not my battle. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. Jehoshaphat, during this time, did not look around and care what other people were doing. He went to seek the Lord. He went to inquire about the Lord. And this is not just some prayer. This is not just some sign you have in your living room. This is really seeking the Lord. Jehoshaphat got the news. He was shaken, but he wasn't shook. I didn't see this coming. The Moabites, the Ammonites, and did you say the Meunites? <laughs> I may be able to fight one, but there are three of them, and they're bigger than me, and they're coming up from behind me. Does anybody in this room have something bigger than you that's trying to get at you when you're most depleted, coming at you from behind? Jehoshaphat's prayer is interesting. He's praying about these three, the Ammonites, the Munites, and the Moabites, but we have enemies too. We have three enemies. We've got the world. We've got the flesh, and the devil. Those are our enemies. The values that oppose your purpose, the patterns that oppose your purpose, and the principality that opposes your purpose. And you may be able to fight one, but how can you fight the devil when you're fighting your own flesh? How do you fight the world when there is a part of us that wants to do everything just like the world? I can fight one, and I may be good at it, but I can't fight them all. And they're coming up on me, and they're bigger than me. How do we raise children in a culture where they've got all the information in their pocket? Anything they want to Google, they can Google. How do we raise children? How do we talk about hot-button topics like sex when they can just Google things? It's right next to the Bible app on the phone. This is real stuff. How do we do it? We have to understand the nature of the battle. If you don't understand the nature of the battle, you won't create the right strategy. You will lose the battle because you will wrestle at the wrong level. Can I preach a bit today? I feel like someone in this room right now is dealing with something that is bigger than them, and they don't know who to fight next. And when you understand the nature of the battle, I'm telling you, you will understand the nature of the strategy. That's why you got to ask God. Jehoshaphat resolved to seek the Lord. He got the priest, the Levites, and he has surrounded himself with the right people. He didn't go to Ahab this time. He didn't ask his friends what they thought about it this time. He didn't ask what celebrity culture in Hollywood thinks about it this time. He didn't call anybody. He went to seek the Lord. He's going to the right place, but he doesn't have a plan. And I want you to see this prayer because I promise you it will help you if you're facing a battle that's bigger than you and if it's snuck up from behind you. Every day this week, God put this on my heart, every day this week, if you're struggling with something, I want you to open up your Bible to Second Chronicles verse 3 and then the following. And if you're fighting a battle that's bigger than you, get in God's face and pray. Pray this prayer. I'm going to read 2 Chronicles verse 2, 5 through 7. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hands, and no one 
can withstand you, our God? Did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Now I'm going to read verses 8 through 10, and I want you to notice a tone shift here. They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before the temple that bears your name, and we will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. Here it is. But, but now, here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. This is kind of like Jehoshaphat saying, hey, this isn't my fault. I didn't ask for this. What I did back with King Ahab, that's on me. You know, I did that. They're coming from behind. And we've done everything right. Or we think we've done everything right. What's going on? And when you're facing a battle, you didn't know what that was coming? It doesn't seem fair. And I'm here to encourage somebody this morning. You're not fighting a battle that you cannot handle. And the reason I say that is because you've already got somebody on your side who knows how to fight. There's something about having a friend that knows how to fight that gives you the confidence to stand up in battle. I remember I was in public high school, not for very long. I'm too delicate for public school, okay? I'm far too delicate of a guy to be in public school. But I was in public school for a while, from about fifth grade, and then I I, I got out of it, and then I went back in it freshman. Anyway. There was a kid named Jack. Jack was the guy you wanted on your side at all times. Jack was a good guy. Jack had a mustache in the fourth grade. (laughs) Jack had a prison record in the sixth grade, I'm sure of it. Jack was a beast, right? But Jack had a heart of gold, and Jack stood up for the little guy. And I remember there was this group of guys who were just the worst in high school and They'd pick on anybody who wasn't in their circle of friends. Guy, girl, it didn't matter. You were toast. Um, If you weren't in their inner circle, and they'd pick on anybody. And Jack knew martial arts. And I'm convinced Jack could kick a tree trunk and snap it in half. He was strong. He knew how to fight. He was in the weight room every day after school at like 14. And I remember in class, it was an English class, teacher got up and had to use the restroom or something. I don't know why she left us all alone in there, but she did. And a couple of that friend group were in there, and they got their eyes set on this one kid who they picked on in the past. And while the teacher leaves, they took this opportunity to stand up, and they're marching towards this kid. And at the same time, Jack, who just befriended this kid, stood up from the back of the class and started walking up and said, "Uh uh-uh, if you're going to pick on this kid, you're going to have a fight with me. I'm here to tell somebody today, if you're dealing with a battle, you might have multiple armies coming up from behind you to try to take you out, but you serve a God who's standing up to fight you, fight for you. It may not seem fair, it may not seem right, and it may seem bigger than you, but it's not bigger than God. Nothing is bigger than God. You are his daughter. You are his son. You are his possession. You are his friend. When you are God's possession, you are God's to protect. I'm going to read on verses 11 through 14. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. The men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came, came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jeel, the son of Madaniah, a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. In the assembly. And I am so glad that somebody stood up. Because if they were getting ready for a battle, they probably would have lost. If you don't understand the battle you're in, you could lose. And some of us are losing because we're fighting the wrong way. We're not preparing for a battle the way that we should be. I had an encounter 
Man, I had an encounter. About a week or so ago, somebody at work, <laughs> I talked to you a few, a few of you about it. I'm not going to get into details about it, okay? We meet so many people every day, and 99% of them are the nicest, kindest people. And then every now and then, someone comes up on you, and you're like, what, what did I do to you? I have no idea what I did to you. And he, can I just be honest this morning? He said something to me that made me so mad made me so mad, I didn't know what to do. I was about to say something, <laughs> and then I heard the voice of God saying, mm -mm, not this one, not this one. Save your energy for the real fight that's coming. Sometimes we encounter people, we encounter things, and it seems like all they want to do is grind our gears. They want to stir up as much trouble as they can, but we have to be able to say to these people, no, not this one. We have to save our energy for the real fight that we're going to have to endure. Because there's going to come a time where the enemy is going to want to fight you. If you're doing everything right, I heard a, a, a preacher tell me they don't care if you're going to church. The enemy don't care if you're going to church. The enemy cares if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and going to church. Because that's when things seem to happen. Let me tell you something. Sometimes it takes more faith not to fight back. I've learned that. Sometimes it takes more faith to let God be God and be great in whatever situation you are in. And let me tell you something. This ain't God's first rodeo, right? If you read the Bible, this ain't God's first time defending something. He's got things planned, and he's got things figured out. And sometimes it's going to take more faith for you just to sit back and let God sort your situation out. We have to understand the nature of the fight so we can conduct a strategy. One reason I don't like arguing with other Christian, Christians is because this battle that we're all going to be facing is not between me and you. It's between us and it. And we have to line up on the same side and let God do what he's going to do. Otherwise, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. You have to fight with a focus. I'm going to get back to the word. Second Chronicles 2015, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. I know it's too big for you. I know it's too big for you. But the battle is not yours. The battle is God's. If the worship team and the singers would come up, I'm going to work on closing here. One battle my wife and I faced very early on in our marriage, like two years into it, was uh, when she was diagnosed with MS. We were stressed, worried. I think we were most, more stressed and worried because she went to about seven or eight doctors, it felt like, and nobody seemed to know what was going on, but we knew something was wrong. And then she was diagnosed, and I remember freaking out. And just the way I am, the way my mind works, I, I don't know, I probably asked, how long does she got, doc? You know, like, I don't know what's going on here. And he calmed me down, and I hounded that doctor for so long in that short amount of time that we were in there because I needed to know. I needed to, I needed to figure out how I was going to fight this. And he told me that she would be all right. And let me tell you something. When we learn to stop fighting that battle and give it to God, she has been all right. She has been all right. We have been so blessed. And can I be, I'm going to be 100%. Things have been great. That doesn't mean that there's not struggles. That doesn't mean that there's not battles. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be something in the future that we face. But as of right now, giving it to the Lord has allowed medications and other things that have come our way that I didn't even know was possible. God is fighting your battles. Even if you're not seeing it, God is fighting your battles. We dealt with infertility. We gave it to God. And during that time, I would be like, well, it's God's got to do what he's going to do. But secretly, in the back of my head, I was still fighting that battle. My, I was still fighting that battle. I thought, no, 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 no. We're going to do all this, 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 this. No, 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 it doesn't work. Nothing works. And I remember sitting in my car with, with my wife driving, and I said, you know what? I've said it a hundred times. I'm serious this time. We're giving it to the Lord. Amen. And about a mm, month or two later, after the doctor said that she would never get pregnant, I got a little crazy boy <laughs> in that back right now, and he is the, the greatest thing that's ever happened to us. I'm going to say something, and I wish some of you 
would receive it. If it's too big for you, it does not belong to you. If it's too big, you have to give it back to God. When the battle, we, we, we act like the battle is the Lord's, but we want to fight this battle like it's ours. All right? We act like the battle is the Lord's, but we worry like it's ours. We stress like it's ours, and we spend all our energy on worrying and stressing when we could have just been worshiping, where we could have been giving everything to God. The battle is not yours. Give it back. It's too big for you. It came up from behind you. You can't do it. Give it back. Give it back. You can't fight it. Give it back. God wants his battle back. God wants his battle back. God wants to do a work for you in your life if you would allow him. God wants to stand up for you and fight you when you don't think things are going the way you want them to go. God wants his battle back. Verse 16, tomorrow march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge and the, je- and the desert of Jerul. March down and get in position for a battle you're not even going to have to fight. God is fighting for you. You are his daughter. You are his son. You are his friend. He loves you. What do you do when the battle chooses you? You worship your way through it. And that sounds good, but it sounds hard. Because here they come. Multiple armies coming up from behind. What do we do, Jehoshaphat? What do we do, Jehoshaphat? How are we going to figure this out? Here's what the prophet said in verse 17. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out and face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. You won't have to fight this battle, but you'll experience the victory. Not by fighting, but by focusing. They won by focusing on the, on the goodness of God. And you know what they did? Let me tell you. This is some of my favorite stuff in Scripture, in the whole Bible. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa, and they set out. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. And as they began to sing in praise, this is my favorite part, the Lord sent out ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them after they finished slaughtering the men from Seir. They helped destroy one another. The enemy starts destroying the other enemy. And that is what happens when you give God his battle back. That is what happens when you fight with a praise and not with your fists. That is what happens when you give God his battle back. So I wonder today, as the, as the singers would come and close us out, I wonder today, do we have an army? Do we have an army who's ready to give this battle to the Lord? Do we have an army who's ready to say, I can't fight this battle by myself? I've been dealing with this diagnosis, but I can't fight this battle by myself. Do we have an army who's ready to stand up and declare the goodness of God? Do we have an army who's ready to stand here and say, you know what? I'm going to lay this at the foot of the cross. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Are we ready to fight with a focus? Are we ready to wrestle on the right level. And as they close us out in worship, I want you to think of all the battles that you're enduring or the battles that you're going to have to endure in the future. Because the, the enemy is going to come and he's going to try his hardest to attack you. 
And God's going to take that situation and flip it according to your purpose. Worship with us this morning. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. For the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle.
Come on, let's sing that again. You take. Yes. You take. Come on, lift your voice and sing it. And you turn it for good. You turn it. Sing, I'm going to see. You take what the enemy meant for God, I thank you. Come on, sing this. I'm going to see a victory. Yes, I am. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Come on, it's his. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, all across this room, can we give God thanks for the victory that he has wrought for us? Come on, can we thank Him for the victory that we have because of Him and through Him? Oh, thank You, Lord. I thank You, Lord. Hallelujah. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3, with the enemy, the unexpected enemy coming from unexpected places, how many like me sometimes you just, it's hard to get your eyes off the issue? Am I the only one? Because, I mean, how else are we going to be able to find the right strategy if we're not watching the enemy and the issue and the problem and you just fill in the blank, right? But this is God's battle. Verse 3, it says, He set His face to seek the Lord. That right there is one of the most difficult, but it is the pivotal moment in what the outcome of your battle is going to be. It's when we get our eyes set on the right thing and seek the face of God. And when we don't know what to do, I forget which verse it was, 12 or 13. When we don't know what to do, we set our eyes on Him. Thank you, Tyler, for this word today. I know you needed this word, but I needed this word today. Amen. I needed this reminder today. I want to set my face. How about we set our face to seek the Lord? This doesn't mean we ignore the problems. It doesn't mean that we're just going to pretend like they aren't there. But we're going to set our face toward the only one who has the power enough. Who knows the workings of the adversary. And he's going to be able to tell us where to go, where to be, where to make our stand. And it may be where you thought would, would be the right place to make a stand, but I've found oftentimes God's plan looked very different than mine. 
and I'm glad I went his way. I've tried my way before. That doesn't turn out well. But I'm thankful that God has a plan. Lord, I thank you that you've brought us together in this room today and that you prepared our hearts not only today but leading up to today. You're preparing hearts of people who may not watch or listen to this message for days. Weeks from now, somebody may be scrolling that YouTube channel and this message leaps out to them and you're, you're readying hearts. But today, we are here. Thank you for burdening the heart of Tyler to bring this word. This practical and powerful word that's easier to hear and celebrate with than it is to actually implement and put into practice. But God, may we have faith enough to trust you when we don't know what to do. May our eyes be found fixed on you and not the problem. May we seek your face for the strategy and the approach and not try to figure out our own way. But it'll be through you that victory will be experienced. And God, you have equipped us today with this timely word. And so we leave with our hearts full, our spirits equipped. The anointing and power of your spirit upon us and within us. And we thank you for what you have done in our hearts and in this house today. And I know you will be with us as we put it into practice. God, I pray let victory that is your posture, let us realize and understand that because we're in you, it is our posture as well. Help us to make the right alliances, the right partnerships, and help us to hear your voice when you stand up in the middle to give us the instruction that we've been seeking you for. May we have ears to receive it, to hear it, and to apply it. God, I thank you for this house and what you're doing in this room, in this people. God, continue to go ahead of us. Go before us, I pray, as we trust and follow you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And let all of Calvary Church say amen. Oh, can we put our hands together and give God a... One last ovation of praise on this Sunday together. God, we honor and celebrate you. You're good and you're great. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a good word. We've got some catching up to do on our YouTube page, but here in not too many days from now, the recent weeks of messages will be edited down to where the sermon itself will be back up and online. And this is a message. You need to share with somebody. Maybe yourself, but you may know somebody who you're thinking, hey, this would be a word for them, or maybe you don't know it yet, but God's equipped us, and I want you to share this word today, amen, and let it be a blessing to them like it's been to us. As we prepare to go in our final act of worship, I want to just instruct us in our generosity and thank you for being so faithful in returning a tithe unto the house of the Lord, unto the Lord and giving your offerings. Just a reminder, as I mentioned last week, two weeks from today, it's Easter, and our offering on Easter Sunday, everything above and beyond the tithe and above and beyond any specific designations like missions or Project Serve that you may allocate, all other offerings and those that you designate, we're going to be giving towards two ministries in this region. One is called Kids for Christ, and the other is called First Priority. It's a Christian club reaching out to strengthen believers, but to reach unbelievers in junior high and high schools all across this region, and we want to help to resource them. So be praying about what you can do when we gather in on Easter so that we can just give generously and bless the efforts of these missions in our area. And so thank you for your continued generosity. I'm going to leave this word with you today from Numbers chapter 6. We ought to have it memorized by now, but I'm going to pull out my cheater right here. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Do you receive it today? Amen. God bless you. Go do some great things for Jesus this week.